Okay, here we are. <laughs> this is measuring research variables. We're just going to go into some of the uh, kind of concepts behind the variables, logical validity, um, looking here ahead, cri criterion validity, validity, content val validity. Oh my goodness, I can't hardly speak today. I'm going to try to get to it. Um, and there's also some reliability that we need to talk about. Uh, just different aspects of the variables, possibly how to measure them. And one definition we'll start off with, or at least one concept is what is actually measuring? What are we actually doing when we measure? It's, and we'll actually see the definition later on in, in another chapter or in another lecture, but it's basically just giving some, uh, a lot of times we're looking at a numerical attribute. So a defined unit of measurement of, uh, of a number to some characteristic. So when you look at height, you're either giving it centimeters, meters, could be inches, could be feet, whatever it might be. You're giving some number to that. So, uh, most of the stuff that we have to do, we are assigning some number, some definitive number to it. It's, um, it's, definite. It's a definite number. Uh, it's not a lot of more qualitative stuff. So it's more of that quantitative type of measurement that we're talking about usually within our field. Not always. Every once in a while we have something that eh, can't really put a number on it. So we're going to do something else with it, but for the most part, we're able to put some numbers to it. So let's go ahead and dive into some of these terms. Here we go. Okay, so the first four terms that we're going to be looking at, logical, content, criterion, and construct validity. So again, val something that is valid or validity itself is asking, does it actually measure what it is supposed to measure? And that's the definition of validity, essentially. So logical validity is essentially, does it actually sound logical? Or is it is it measuring what it's supposed to, supposed, supposed to in a logical sense? So if a measurement involves some type of performance that's being measured, if you're measuring something else that is completely different than what you're wanting to actually measure in the performance, then what's the point? There's no valid measurement in there. So for instance, if you are wanting to measure heart rate, but you're taking blood pressure, not a very valid way of getting blood pressure all the time. Uh, now you could, there's some ways to do it. And there's also devices that, that will do it during blood pressure, but maybe let's take another one. If you're wanting to measure your bench press one repetition maximum, Taking blood pressure probably isn't the best way. So that's just a logical sense. It's kind of more of like a common sense type, type of thing, whether or not common sense actually exists. I guess we're getting uh, to a philosophical debate on that. But anyway, let's continue on. Content validity. Does the test sample what was covered in the course? So the So looking at the actual content, and that example I gave was more of a of an example like you would have in a class. So a test or an exam or a quiz is essentially what we do during a research trial. We're giving a test to a subject. Now, psychologically speaking, speaking and emotionally speaking, it might not be as dramatic um, in the research trial, but in class, we try to, as teachers, as professors, we try to make sure that the content on the exam or the quiz is representative of what was actually covered in the course. And if it's not, it's not a valid representation of your knowledge of that content that we went over. So that's what the content validity is. The criterion validity is the test is related to other valid tests or other criteria. So you can have concurrent validity in that you could have a different test run at the same time during that trial or that study to make sure you have a valid number 
associated with that attribute. So for instance, you could have a one mile run test and a true VO2 max test when you're actually measuring the gases and so forth to actually get a good representation of, are the two tests valid? Are you measuring a uh, the VO2 in a valid way with either one of those tests? Or are you measuring it in a consistent manner as well? Now the construct validity is the measurement of the traits that are not necessarily or not easily observable. So for instance, this one could be like anxiety, intelligence, sportsmanship. These are not necessarily attributes that we can give a pure number to. We can maybe categorize them. Uh, we can label them in certain ways, but we it, it's tough to actually give them a um, something that's more observable. You can kind of see it. You can kind of feel it. <laughs> There are ways to possibly measure it, but it's a little bit more difficult uh, to do that other than, um, you know, some sorts of maybe psychological tests or some surveys. Um, Observation is really kind of the key there. You can't measure it like you can't heart rate or blood pressure or VO2 uh, or height, weight, whatever it might be. So a lot of these are kind of hypothetical um, constructs of how the certain tests actually measure these phenomenon and these characteristics. Another example of construct validity uh, that we hear about all the time are IQ tests. Uh, We can, we can give them and there, there is something there we can put a number to it, but sometimes that number may or may not actually associate with somebody's knowledge. They could just be a good test taker. I mean, there's, there's a lot of different variables there that could, uh, could affect the test Um, and how well, Can you actually measure intelligence too? Some people are extremely intelligent on certain subjects and not so much on others. I'll give you a perfect example. Perfect, perfect example. Uh, For me, for me, I can tell you a lot about the human body. I can, I don't know everything about the human body, but I know a lot about the human body. Um, And I know how it works for the most part. Uh, Some of the intricate details especially during physical activity, the responses, the adaptations. But when I open the hood of a vehicle, holy cow, (laughs) you know, it's a bad situation. Uh, I can, I can change oil and I can, I can change a battery if I needed to. And I can uh, put uh, windshield washer fluid in. Could change a tire too. You ask me to change brakes, rotors, uh, transmission fluid, uh, work on the motor. <laughs> no, 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 no. You better better not allow me to do that to your vehicle. So um, now, not to say that I couldn't learn, but I'm just, I'm just saying anyway. Boy, that was a really weird rant there. It was in my mind because I just had my truck fixed and. I had to get a bunch of work done and someone's like, you're not doing it yourself. I'm like, <laughs> no, no. let's move on. All right. Looking at measurement reliability, the overview of this, uh, the consistency, the repeatability of the measurement is key and the consistency, something can be consistent and repeatable. Uh, now it may not actually be valid and it may not actually be a true score, but it could be consistent. Now here's, here's the thing is that every single measurement that we have, at least that we know of, there's probably going to be an error score. I I can't think of anything where there isn't some sort of error. Now the error might be so small that it's insignificant. For instance, when we take height, my height is usually I usually measure myself, uh, not necessarily myself, but even other people measuring me. I'm usually about 5'10". Five, 5'10 five foot ten inches. It could be 5'10 inches or 10 and 1 eighth inches. It could be 5'10 uh, and a half. It could be 5'9 and 5 eighths. Some of that may depend upon what time of day you're measuring somebody. 
uh, what age they are, because as we uh, age, sometimes our our back starts to compress a little bit. Um, and injuries have thing, have uh, some influence on that as well. Weight is the same exact thing. It's going to fluctuate, um, but also how well is the scale going to actually measure your actual weight? It could be off by a tenth of a pound, could be off by five pounds, could be off by a hundredth of a pound. It could be off by a thousandth of a pound. That's still an error, but I would rather it be off by a thousandth of a pound than by five pounds. I guess maybe depending, (laughs) depending upon which way the, the error is, if it's weighing you less then maybe you want it to be off by five, five pounds. Anyway, there's going to be some error that is involved there. And that's added on to what the true score or the true number actually is. So that gives us our observation, what we observed the score to be. Hopefully that error is so small and it's, it's consistent. It's consistently a thousandth of a pound off or the, uh, the measurement of height might be off by, you know, a, a hundredth of an inch each time. As long as it's consistent, it's not giving you these wide range of numbers, it can still be reliable. But keep in mind that we're always going to have an error. We just want to try to reduce the amount of error in those measurements as much as possible. Now, there's a lot of sources of measurement error. Uh, you can probably think of a lot of them. The equipment could be broken. The equipment could be cheap and not built very well. It could be miscalibrated. Uh, for something like weight, there's going to be a large fluctuation throughout the day, throughout the week, throughout the year of somebody's weight. Also, height, same thing. I kind of went over that as well. And even heart rate. Heart rate is variable also. And how good is the heart rate monitors? What type of heart rate monitor are you using? Is it a smartwatch? Is it a uh, Fitbit? Is it an actual heart rate monitor? Like the things that actually only do heart rate and only measure heart rate? Um, so what is it? What is? How are you actually measuring it? How good is the equipment? And we need to stack these up amongst all of the other pieces that we measure heart rate and all these other scores from and see how reliable they are. And also expressing reliability through some sort of correlation or intraclass. So the the intraclass being amongst that class of types of measurements, basically, is what I was discussing, uh, you know, comparing the different types of VO2 measurements, uh, ways to measure heart rate and all the different pieces of equipment that could be used to measure that. And we have an inner class. So we have some simple correlations uh, that, that could go on and also look at the weaknesses within maybe a certain test and how reliable it is. One way I'll, uh, I'll kind of look at this is and give an example of this is if you're giving an exam, and usually this is what happens with a classroom setting, you're giving an, giving an exam throughout various different semesters, semester after semester after semester, and it's usually about the same exact exam. Maybe not exactly the same exam, but for the most part, the same content questions could be exactly the same or very, very similar. And you're trying to determine is each class having around the same scores. If one class is averaging an A and the other class is averaging a D, you know that something happened. It could have been the way you taught it. It could have been the, the material itself. It could have just been a completely different class. Maybe it was a weaker class uh, or maybe a stronger class than the other one. Maybe the average really should be a B or a C. It just had the two extremes going on there. So trying to find some correlations uh, and seeing if there's a reliable test to accurately determine if the students are retaining or at least knowing the material when giving the exam. Now through intraclass measurements, we will be using something like an ANOVA. This is an analysis of variance with repeated measures. So you're looking at uh, trial to trial variations as a measurement error over time. Uh, A lot of times in our uh, research, we'll actually do something like this where we have multiple different periods within a trial that we're going to be measuring the different time points. And then within that group, we're going to see if there is a difference 
amongst the time points and over those time points. And that's essentially what an ANOVA does. Uh, that repeated measures is we're measuring the same thing over different periods of time. So re we are repeating the measures and we're looking at the variance over that repeated measures. So analysis of variance. Now there could be some instances with this that we could be discarding some trials because of some maybe large, large variances, uh, some errors that are, that are popping up, maybe some outliers and trying to ignore trial to trial variation because again, uh, going back to the, the last lecture that I, um, that I went over, we are humans. We are, there's going to be some variation with different testing methods. There's going to be some variation with how we, we respond to them, how any human responds. So there's going to be a little bit of variation, but if it's a huge variation, if it is significantly different and you're testing the same exact things with the same types of people, same gender, same age class, uh, same race, same fitness levels. And there's this huge variation in this, um, unreliable data that you're getting from the measurement. Then there's something else going on there. Uh, but we can test some of this through, uh, analysis of variance and actually an ANOVA with repeated measures is actually one of the, um, one of the tests that we use a lot of times to try to get some of these significant differences or no significant differences between uh, groups or within groups. Now well, we could determine stability. So this is like a re test retest and then use the interclass method then uh, to, to keep this going, to make sure we have a reliable test. So keeping with the classroom setting, we could hand out a, an exam and take that score, the average score, uh, maybe the scores amongst a certain group, within the class and then retest the class, hand back, hand the exact same exam out, retest it over and over again, and then use the interclass method, maybe use an ANOVA to, to try to get uh, a, a representation of how reliable the test is and make sure that those numbers are remaining stable throughout the measurement time frame. Then we could be constructing alternate forms and alternate tests if we are not getting a good reliable group of numbers throughout the testing period. Then also obtaining internal consistency. So we could look at maybe same day testing and retesting uh, because usually on the same day, depending upon what the test is, if it's a VO2 max test, we shouldn't be testing it the same day and retesting it. Uh, that's going to throw the numbers off quite a bit. At least it usually, usually will. But we could do some tests and retest within the same day, even within five minutes of one another. Uh, we could be doing that with heart rate. Uh, we could be doing it with VO2. We could be doing it with a bunch of other tests um, immediately after the initial test, just to make sure that we don't have a large error. Then we could also have a what's known as a split half technique in which half the class will actually take one test and half the class will take another test. And then we're just going to compare them. They could even take the same test, but we're just going to make sure that each of those halves are, are consistent that we have a reliable test. So all of this is just helping to determine whether or not the test is reliable and it's consistent and valid. Now, some of the measurement types and various types of characteristics that we have within our field so we have movement. So that could be a lot of different things. That, that, that's a huge scope. We look at speed, agility, uh, could, could even be related to fitness levels, uh, could be expressed in miles per hour, kilometers per hour, feet per second, whatever it might be. Could even be the actual specific movement, internal, external rotation, flexion, extension. We could be looking at angular velocities. Another one too, we have affective behavior. So these are some of the attitudes or the personality types. So we could have maybe some psychological tests on what are some of the attitudes towards physical activity, certain types of diets, supplementation, uh, whatever it might be. And then also some personality tests. Maybe you've taken some of them. Sometimes those personality tests almost make you feel like you're crazy, at least me, because I probably take them way 
I look into them way too much and way, too, way too seriously. And I probably don't follow, follow the directions as well as I probably should have. And then the last one here, uh, scales for effective behavior. A lot of times we're going to be looking at Likert type of scales. Now, a Likert type of scale is essentially going to be a line. I don't know if I can draw one here, but I'll try to draw one. And you basically have two points in the end. Uh, that's one version of it anyway. Another version is you could have one, two, three, four, five, or as many numbers as you want. You could, be, could have A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, I, J, K. You could have whatever you want, but it's basically a line and you're determining where in that line that person falls in terms of their effective behavior or some sort of, um, of question where there may be some qualitative aspect to it, but you're trying to put a number to it. You're trying to put an actual data point on it. So that Likert scale can be used a lot of times in how well you like something. And sometimes you will even see, see these with numbers or letters under them. And you'll have, I liked that a lot. Uh, I liked it. Uh, I was indifferent. I didn't like it and I hated it. So you have varying types of levels of what, what you like about the exercise or maybe what you like about something, whatever the, whatever the question was. Um, so you could have those scales. And one example that I'll give is I had a uh, professor in grad school. He was measuring uh, likeness of, or the, how well kids, little, little kids that were actually prepubescent kids, uh, how well they like certain exercises. And he actually had this Likert scale and it was, I believe it was 10 centimeters long. He made sure to make it 10 centimeters long on a piece of paper. And he just said on this line from this point to this point, how well did you like it? And the point way off to the left was didn't like it at all. Point way off to the right was this is my favorite exercise. Loved it. I loved it. And they would just put a mark, put an X there. And we would measure how far it was. We would take that measurement and that was how well they liked it. So it could be five centimeters. It could be 10 centimeters. It could be 8.2 centimeters. So whatever it was, uh, that's the data that was put into the, uh, to the spreadsheet then. So you can use Likert scales a lot of different ways. All right. Some of the rating errors that we could have on these rating scales, like the Likert scale, we can have a central tendency where everybody kind of just seems to be in the middle somewhere. There's no, um, there's no good amount of people that are on the outskirts, either really love something or really hate something or, you know, vice versa, whatever it might be. They're just all kind of centered in the middle somewhere. That could be an error. Could also be a halo error in which there is nobody or hardly anybody in the center. Everybody either loves it or everybody hates it. So those are kind of the two extremes. So you have this halo kind of around the center. And then you can have the observer bias as well as the observer expectation. Some of this can go into play when somebody could be uh, almost representing the question in a way in which the observer subconsciously most of the time, but they, they, kind of ask the question or maybe point towards a certain area of that Likert scale that they subconsciously feel like the person needs to choose or wants them to choose. Again, some of this is subconscious. It's not a, um, something usually that is done deliberately, but they could point to say, Hey, somewhere on this graph and they could point to, to maybe always in the center where do you think you uh, feel, how do you feel about this exercise? And they're always pointing towards the center somewhere in here, put a mark. Or they could always say over here, somewhere near this area, you know, on the very far, far right side, which would be the very uh, end of the scale that says, I really love this exercise. Say, you know, somewhere on this graph, somewhere on this line, put a mark. And they could be always pointing to that one location. And that's going to cause some error because that could, uh, from a psychological standpoint, point people more towards that particular area of the Likert scale. 
And that's certainly not good. Uh, certain ways that you ask questions and surveys could uh, manipulate, again, subconsciously, I'm not saying this is done deliberately, but it could start to manipulate uh, somebody's feeling about a certain subject, uh, just the way the question is asked. So there's some errors there uh, that could occur just by the simple uh, way the sentence is structured and the question is structured. So it's always important to have other people read the questions before you put them up online uh, or on paper and hand them out to the subjects. That way we reduce those errors uh, the best we can. All right. So that was it. That was, uh, that was the uh, measuring the variables. Uh, just again, just a really short overview of this. Uh, we'll go into maybe some more details of this here later. Uh, in fact, actually here in another couple lectures, we'll be getting into it maybe a little bit more detail. Uh, but at least give you some overview of it. And I think I'm going to go ahead and stop now. My voice is uh, kind of kind of going a, a little bit. So I've been talking quite a bit. <sighs> Hopefully I don't sound too, too, too froggy. But uh, anyway, if you have any questions, any comments, please let me know. If not, uh, take care and thanks for watching.